grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Jane Austen's second novel. Jane Austen's a famous writer. Jane Austen's second no novel was originally called First Impressions. But after the, the huge success that her first book, Sense and Sensibility, had, she felt like she had to change the name. You know, for commercial reasons, they thought it would be better that her second novel kind of followed the same pattern as the first one in its name, that it have two words that are kind of similar, starting with the same letter, like sense and sensibility. So her second book was given the name Pride and Prejudice. Maybe you've heard of it. Some of you maybe have seen the movie. Maybe even one or two of you actually read it. Anybody? Now nah, that's what I thought. It's okay. But my opinion, my humble opinion, Pride and Prejudice isn't the, the best name for the book. I mean, sure, you can see a lot of pride and prejudice in the convoluted love story between Elizabeth Bennet and Mr. Darcy. But I actually like the first title better. Because if you read the book, all of their problems came about because they struggled to get past their first impressions of each other. Pride and Prejudice would actually be a better title for our first reading for today. Let's take a look at why. Our text for this morning is our first reading from Numbers chapter 12. Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses, they asked? Hasn't he also spoken through us? And the Lord heard this. Now, Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. At once the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out to the tent of meeting, all three of you. So the three of them went out. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud. He stood at the entrance to the tent and summoned Aaron and Miriam. When the two of them stepped forward, he said, Listen to my words. When there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, re reveal myself to them in visions. I speak to them in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? The anger of the Lord burned against them, and he left them. When the cloud lifted from above the tent, Miriam's skin was leprous. It became as white as snow. Aaron turned toward her and saw that she had a defiling skin disease. And he said to Moses, Please, my Lord, I ask you not to hold against us the sin we, we have so foolishly committed. Do not let her be like a stillborn infant coming from its mother's womb with its flesh half eaten away. So the Moses cried out to the Lord, Please, God, heal her. The Lord replied to Moses, if her father had spit in her face, would she not have been in disgrace for seven days? Confine her outside the camp for seven days. After that, she can be brought back. So Miriam was confined outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not move on till she was brought back. This is the word of the Lord. Aaron and Miriam were Moses' older brother and sister. Okay. If you remember, Miriam was the, 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 the older sister that, that hid in the reeds when Moses floated down the Nile River in the basket toward Pharaoh's daughter. And when God called Moses as an adult to lead his people out of slavery, Aaron and Miriam became rather famous. You know, they were Moses' brother and sister. Aaron became Moses' spokesman before Pharaoh, and he was later appointed high priest. Miriam became a prophetess. God actually spoke to her directly. And though God had showered their family with many blessings, all was not well in Moses' family. Our text tells us, Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife. You see, Moses was a widower. His first wife had died. And so he married another woman. And she was from the, 
the land of Cush, which is in North Africa. She was a foreigner. She would have been a different race. She may even have been black. And Miriam and Aaron had a problem with that. And in the original Hebrew, it makes it very clear that Miriam was the one who was instigating all of this. Now, it doesn't tell us what exactly their problem was, whether it was the color of her skin, the way she spoke, or just the fact that she wasn't a Jew. But whatever the specific reason, Aaron and Miriam had a problem with her because she was a Cushite. In other words, they were prejudiced. In our society today, prejudice is often equated with, with racism. But, but prejudice can actually take many forms. And in Jane Austen's novel, Pride and Prejudice, the prejudice didn't have anything to do with, with race or, or nationality or the color of a person's skin. It had to do with social class and money. The people from the city looked down on the people who lived out in the country. You see, the word prejudice comes from the word prejudge. To judge somebody beforehand. And prejudice can be judging people for a number of reasons. For, for the color of their skin, the way they talk, the way they dress, where they're from, what political party they belong to. Because prejudice involves stereotyping. Judging a person before you really know them. And prejudice always involves thinking you're better than somebody else. Prejudice always involves pride. And we see that pride and prejudice in Aaron and Miriam. They didn't like the fact that their little brother had married that foreign woman. They didn't like the fact that their little brother was now in charge of them. So they began to talk bad about him and to undermine him. They may even have tried to get rid of him and take in control of the, the people. Pride and prejudice had taken hold of their, their hearts. But the truth is, pride and prejudice are found in every human heart. Nobody has to teach you how to be proud. Nobody has to teach you how to be prejudiced. It comes very naturally to us as humans. And as I said, prejudice takes many forms. It, it, it often takes the, the form of racism. And that racism can be obvious, like the, the Ku Klux Klan. But it can also be a little bit more subtle. You know, making quiet little snide, off-color remarks to people who understand where you're coming from. Or simply just prejudging other people before you know them based on the color of their, their skin. And you may be thinking right now, I'm not racist. I don't have a problem with black people or Mexicans or white people. But let me ask you this. How would you react if your son or daughter, grandson or granddaughter, said they wanted to marry somebody whose skin was a different color than yours. Prejudice takes many forms. But it always involves sin. It always involves pride. Thinking you're better than somebody else. And right now in our country, whether you like to admit it or not, Republicans think they're better than Democrats. And Democrats think they're better than Republicans. And they don't just think that their, their platform or political stance is better or wiser. They actually think they are better people, superior to those dumb people from the other party. Honestly, deep down, don't you feel that way sometimes? Pride and prejudice are in all of our hearts. And the truth is that pride and prejudice are both a lie. 
Because nobody is better than anybody else. Nobody is more important in God's eyes than anybody else. No matter what color of skin you have, whether you're black or white, tall or short, rich or poor, male or female, Republican or Democrat. But then what's the cure for our pride and prejudice? Well, the cure for pride and prejudice is, is really takes two steps. The first is to, to look at yourself honestly in the mirror. Because pride is really a distorted view of self. The cure for pride is to look at yourself honestly in the mirror and see all of your failures and faults. The cure for pride is to look at honestly into the mirror of God's law and see all the ways you've messed up. The cure for pride is recognizing that on your own, you couldn't have achieved any of the things you've achieved. You know, there's a, a prayer many Lutheran pastors say in the sacristy. The sacristy is that room back there where I, I get changed. It's called Luther's Sacristy Prayer. I prayed it this morning before coming out here. And in the prayer, it, it talks about what we do as pastors. And at one point it says, Lord, if I had lacked your help, I would have ruined all of this long ago. You know, I could come out here and see a full church. See all of the good things going on in our church. And the devil whispers in my ear, look at all that you have accomplished. Nope. And this isn't false humility when I say this. If it were left up to me, I would have ruined all of this long ago. The cure for pride and prejudice is recognizing that everything good we are and everything good we accomplish is because of God's amazing grace. The cure for pride and prejudice is knowing Jesus and what he did for us. I mean, think about it. The all-powerful God of all things humbled himself to be born in a manure-spelling barn. He humbled himself to be born among ignorant, prejudiced, pride-filled people. In fact, he let, in his humility, he let those ignorant, prejudiced, pride-filled people spit on him and beat him and nail him to a piece of wood. And he did that. He humbled himself. He submitted and served in order to save us from our pride and prejudice. And he did save us. He saved us in every way a person can be saved. He saved us from the punishment we deserve, from the, the death and hell we deserve. For our pride and prejudice. But here's the amazing thing. He didn't just forgive us. He hasn't just saved us. He also gives us all kinds of amazing blessings. He showers us with, with gifts and abilities, with success in our lives that we definitely don't deserve and would never be able to accomplish if He hadn't created us and saved us and helped us the entire way. On our own, we would have ruined all of this long ago. And that's the cure for pride. That's the cure for prejudice. That's how, how Moses was able to stay so humble, even though God had allowed him to accomplish these amazing miracles and talk to him face to face and, and be the leader of a, a people of over a million res citizens. Moses understood that everything he was and everything that he accomplished was because of God's amazing grace. And Aaron and Miriam, 
also got to experience that amazing grace firsthand. Because God forgave them. He healed Miriam. Neither of them deserved God's forgiveness and mercy, but that's the kind of God we have. In the end, God taught Aaron and Miriam true humility. And we see God doing that a lot in the Bible. We see all kinds of people who God had to teach humility. Think of Joseph, who thought he was better than all his brothers, having to spend years as a slave and a prisoner till God finally set him free. Or think of Peter, who thought he would never waver in the faith. He would never deny Jesus, fall flat on his face. Or Paul, who in his pride and prejudice actually persecuted and killed Christians. And how God humbled him on the road to Damascus. My friends, learn from these examples. Don't make God have to teach you humility. Don't go around thinking you're better than anybody else. Don't judge other people because of the, the color of their skin or the language they speak or, or the political party they belong to. You and I are no better than anybody else. So be humble. Fight against the pride and prejudice in your heart by looking at yourself honestly in the mirror every single day. And then look at your Savior who has made you everything good that you are. Remember what the, the Christian writer John Flavel once wrote. He said, They that truly know God will be humble. And those that honestly know themselves can never be proud. Be humble. Amen. And now may that peace of God which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.